Hey church, welcome to episode three of our series, Under the Sun, an expository journey through the book of Ecclesiastes. And today we're going to be in chapter four and parts of chapter two. So if you, if you have your Bible at home, turn to the book of Ecclesiastes chapter four. We're going to start in verse four and read through verse eight. So let's read God's word together. It says this, then I saw that all the toil and all skill and work come from a man's envy of his neighbor. This, is also, this also is vanity and striving after wind. The fool folds his hands and eats his own flesh. Better is a handful of quietness than two handfuls of toil and of striving after wind. Again, I saw vanity under the sun. One person who has no other, either son or brother, Yet there is no end to all his toil, and his eyes are never satisfied with riches, so that he never asks, for whom am I toiling and depriving myself of pleasure? This also is vanity and an unhappy business. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You know, we live in a work-obsessed culture. So many of us are captivated by the thought that if we can just reach a certain level in our career, if we can just accomplish certain goals, then we will be satisfied. And so what we begin to do is we scan the environment to see where we stack up in our career, how our work is going, how our goals are progressing. So we look at our physical friends, we look at our digital friends, and we begin to evaluate, how do I feel? Am I ahead of my friends? Am I behind? And as we begin to sort through this, and as we begin to scan these different accomplishments, we think to ourselves, what do I need to do to push myself forward, to grow, to achieve? Because we are on this quest for accomplishment, hoping that it will provide meaning and satisfaction. And as we're on this journey, typically, I think two things happen. There are two syndromes. I've created two syndromes when you evaluate yourself against your physical friends or your digital friends. See, we all know that when you feel like you're ahead of other people in your career, it makes you feel proud. It makes you feel as if you're doing something right. But when you recognize or feel like you are behind, you are not where you thought you would be at the age that you are. You have not reached the goals that you thought you would have years ago, and you see other people accomplishing things that you hope you will one day. It causes you to feel like a failure. And one of two syndromes becomes true of you. First one is the Eeyore syndrome, where you begin to look at yourself and you view yourself with great disappointment. You begin to beat yourself up and critique yourself and judge yourself and you decrease the value in yourself. You really engage in self-sabotage because you feel like a failure because you're behind in your quest for accomplishment. The other syndrome that many of us fall into when we're in this position is what I'm calling the Eowyn syndrome. Now you may say, what is Eowyn syndrome? Eowyn is a, a character from the Lord of the Rings she is a shield maiden of Rohan. I love Lord of the Rings. Maybe you do too. And she was told her entire life that she had to stay in the village and carry out what were the stereotypical duties for women. And she felt like she was meant to be a warrior, that she wanted to be on the battlefield. And so she did whatever was necessary to hide her identity, to break against and break away from social norms and conventions placed upon her. 
She disguised herself, actually, to go and ride into battle and to fight, ultimately culminating in her killing the witch king. Now, Eowyn syndrome, when you feel like a failure or you feel like there's barriers in your life or you have not accomplished what you desire, it's that, it's that feeling that you get that you're going to strive and you're going to push and you're going to do whatever is necessary. And many of us have this type of syndrome when we evaluate ourselves against our physical or digital friends. And in fact, it's interesting. Some studies have shown that most of us have an Eowyn syndrome. In fact, there was a study a few years ago that found that 96% of people between the ages of 18 and 29, 96% believe that they will achieve what they want in life, that at some point they will get to the end that they desire. Oftentimes because they believe that they will do whatever is necessary to accomplish their goals and to fill their life with their desired accomplishments. You know, Tony, Tony Shea, who was the CEO of Zappos, a billion-dollar company, and was known to be somebody who spoke about how you could derive lasting happiness in your career and in your work, wrote in his book this quote. He said that we are to envision, create, and believe in your own universe, and the universe will form around you. His advice is that you should envision, create, and believe in your own universe, the quest that you are embarking on for accomplishment, in your career, in your work, with your goals, and the universe will form around you. Well, tragically, in his life, he had some difficulties that he faced, and actually last year, uh, he died from what investigators see, believe is a self-inflicted uh, death. You see, he struggled to even live out the very thing that he promoted because it's not that easy to say that I'm just going to envision and create and believe in the universe that I want for myself on the, the quest for accomplishment that I am on and everything's just going to form around me. Now, you may begin to see some things fall into place, but here's one thing that is 100% true. If you begin to envision and create and believe that the universe is just going to form around you and your quest for accomplishment is going to provide all that you desire, some things may form around you, but that is certainly going to form in you. It is going to form in your heart and in your mind and in your soul. This belief that this journey towards accomplishment in your career is going to provide the meaning and the satisfaction that you desire. And the question that is haunting, and I think haunts so many people, is what if it doesn't? What if it doesn't provide what I think it will? What if I don't reach the goals that I have for myself? What if I don't accomplish what I desire? What will be the effect then? You see, the trap that we find ourselves in is that we begin to justify our lives with accomplishments. And so as we begin to accomplish more and more, we take little steps forward in our career and we begin to accomplish certain goals, we begin to justify our lives. So we think, if it, once we get a promotion, now I'm gonna ju justify my life. Once I accomplish this goal, I'm gonna justify my life. And the reason we do this, I believe, and the reason we focus so much on accomplishment and we justify our lives with these gains that we make is because we want to use that as a mask to hide everything else, to hide some of the fears and the insecurities and even the thought that what if we're going on a quest that is going to prove meaningless and we're not going to find the meaning and satisfaction that we desire in our career and in the things that we can accomplish. And the preacher, the Koheleth here in Ecclesiastes 4, is going to lead you on this journey that he went through. 
because he thought the same thing, that he could just envision and create and believe in his own universe and it would all form around him. But what he saw is that it formed in him. And what formed in him did not provide any sort of meaning that was lasting or satisfaction, but a vanity, an emptiness, felt worthless. And so he says this in verse 4 as we read in chapter 4. He says, Then I saw that all the toil and all skill and work come from a man's envy of his neighbor. This also is vanity and a striving after the wind. See, the reason that he says that he felt like everything was vain, that it was a vapor, that it was fleeting, it was temporary, it was a worthless pursuit, this quest for accomplishment, is that he saw the motivation for himself and other people, which was envy. Envy. Now, envy is contagious. And we know it's contagious because you struggle with envy, I struggle with envy, and every single person you know does. And it only makes it more difficult in a connected world like we live in in 2021 where we can see into so many people's lives. We begin to feel envious of their jobs, of their financial freedom, of the experiences they have, the vacations they take, the family structure they have, the accomplishments that they have accumulated, the recognition that they receive. We begin to feel envy. You see, I think something is deep within all of us, and that is this. We have a desire to outshine other people and not be outshone. We don't want to be outshone, especially in the areas where we feel like we have expertise, where we're really driving and pushing ahead. The quest that we're on, we don't want to be outshone. And this takes different forms for each and every one of us, but each one of us has an understanding and a description for our lives on what it means to shine. What a life would look like if we were really shining and flourishing. And we want to live that life. You see, envy is wrapped up in this because what envy is is making something the direct end of our meaning and satisfaction. Envy is when you take something, anything, and you make it the direct end of your satisfaction and meaning. If I can just have this, then I'll be satisfied. If I just accomplish this, I will derive meaning from that. It becomes the direct end of meaning and satisfaction. And here's a dirty little secret. And I'm sure you know this. But it never ends. Envy never ends. You never accomplish everything you want. You never reach every goal. There's always something else to do. There's always someone else to surpass. There's always someone else that has something that you don't have that you want to have. It never ends. Here's a great example. There are several billionaires, almost trillionaires in our world that have everything known to mankind, everything imaginable. They have so much money, they have transcended any restrictions on life. They can do whatever they want. And it's not enough. They have to all now be competing in a space race to see who can get their rocket to Mars and who can put the most people in outer space flights. Because it never ends. You never have enough. You've never accomplished enough. That's what the, the preacher is telling us. He felt it was all vanity. It was fleeting. Because envy was the basis and the motivation for the quest for accomplishment, for the toil and the striving and work, and everybody is on that same journey. So, a 19th century philosopher named John Stuart Mill. He has a great quote on this, this idea, this understanding of this quest for accomplishment and envy. He says this, I place my happiness in something durable and distant. 
in which some progress might always be making, while it could never be exhausted by complete attainment, this did very well for several years. But the time came when I woke as from a dream. See, he says that he placed these goals, these visions before him, and he just was making progress, trying to find meaning and satisfaction in the progress towards the accomplishing of that goal. And for years, it was working. But ultimately, he woke from that dream because it wasn't reality and it wasn't true. And that's true of his story. John Stuart Mill awoke from a dream and had a nervous breakdown and struggled deeply with depression and with just the understanding of what life is all about. And he later wrote this. He said, I now thought that this end was only to be attained by not making it the direct end. The only way to attain any sort of satisfaction or joy in accomplishing your goals or in your career and your toil is to not make it the direct end. It's so hard to not do that. Such a temptation. The preacher uses an example in his own life, which was the direct end of accomplishing money, having a lot of money and financial freedom. So he speaks about this in verse 7 through 8, and he says this, Again, I saw under the sun one person who has no other, either son or brother, yet there is no end to all his toil, and his eyes are never satisfied with riches, so that he never asks, for whom am I toiling and depriving myself of pleasure? This is also vanity and an unhappy business. He speaks about the people that he observes as he's on this quest for accomplishment. And as we talked about last week, that he, he did pursue the attainment of money for pleasure and for meaning. He says, I, I saw people too that had nothing to work for. In the sense that they had, they had no son, they had no brother, they couldn't justify their quest for accomplishment by saying, oh, it's not really for me, it's, it's for my family. So many of us justify our quest for accomplishment because we fool ourselves into thinking that the only reason that we're on this quest for accomplishment in our career is for other people. Certainly there's an element of that. But what he's getting to is that deep down all of us are on this quest for ourselves. And you see that, that there are so many people that have no one to leave any money to, and yet they're on the same quest just like you. They're never satisfied with what their eyes see. It's never enough. And he asked that challenging question. For whom am I toiling and depriving myself of pleasure? You see, this quest for accomplishment that he's speaking about, in particular in work, career, and toiling, it's dehumanizing. You lose your identity because your hopes, your fears, everything is wrapped up in what you can accomplish. Maybe trying to justify that it's for somebody else, but it's really for you. And it's really disappointing, too. It's a disappointing endeavor. There was a study that took place in 2011. I find this fascinating. The study took two different groups of people. One group read an article on happiness, and then they watched a movie on happiness. The other group read an article that had nothing to do with happiness whatsoever, and they watched that same movie on happiness. And what they found is that the group that went into the movie in a state of happiness, expecting for that movie to produce more happiness, walked away disappointed. Where the other group that had no expectations for happiness walked away feeling happier. And that was their assessment. Their assessment was that when you focus on trying to derive satisfaction or meaning, it will never quite reach your expectation. Maybe you've had that with a movie. 
We say that sometimes. I'm not going in with high expectations because I don't want to be disappointed. Because if you go in with too high expectations, you're most likely going to come out disappointed. And this happens in our lives. We prop up so many things that if we can just reach this, if we can just attain this, if we can just accomplish this goal, reach to this level, then we'll be happy. We'll have meaning. We'll feel satisfied. And it never quite lives up to what we imagined. And so instead of recognizing that our presupposition for where we're going to derive meaning and satisfaction is wrong, we just prop something else back up. Try a different path. Try to accomplish something new. The preacher in chapter 2 is reflecting on his journey. He says this in verse 20. He says, So I turned about and gave my heart up to despair over all the toil of my labors under the sun. His assessment, as I said at the very beginning, is that all of the toil, and all of the work, and the quest that he was on to accomplish all of these things was a waste. It was vanity, fleeting, temporary. It sounds like bad news. It sounds like, and there's nothing to be found in the quest for accomplishment in your career, in the attainment of goals. Sounds like bad news. But listen, Christianity is always bad news before it's good news. Because the cross comes before the resurrection. It's bad news before good news. And there is good news for you here today in God's word. The cross comes before the resurrection. The struggle comes before victory. Suffering before triumph. You see, faith, faith is the realization that we are broken, that we are sinful, and we are deserving of God's wrath. That is bad news. Sinful, broken, deserving of God's wrath. But God loves you, and God made a way to forgiveness and restoration and healing And that is the good news of Jesus Christ. That through the cross, which was bad news, comes resurrection. Resurrection and a restoration of your life to God. There's a constant theme in Scripture of struggle struggle before triumph. The cross before resurrection. And it reveals something to us. It reveals to us that our faith moves from horizontal focus to a vertical focus. Think about your faith in Christ. If you have surrendered your life to Jesus, your faith begun with a horizontal focus. You looked at the cross that happened in real time and space. Jesus really lived. He really died. He was really buried, and he was really resurrected. And when you look at the cross and you kneel before the cross and you see Jesus' body literally broken for you, that horizontal focus leads you to look up, to a vertical focus, to see the wonder of God, his grace to you, and the restoration of your relationship eternally. You see, the horror of the cross, as you look upon it horizontally, leads you to look up vertically at the wonder of a gracious God. And that same understanding, that our faith that looks horizontally eventually looks up and sees the transcendent, the great and gracious God and his love for us, that application is also to be applied in your career, in your work, in your quest for accomplishment. We look out all the time. Our focus is so horizontal. Accomplish this, goals here, career here. We're always looking out in a horizontal direction. But we are to look vertical. It should move us to look up. That's what the preacher says in verse 24. He comes to this conclusion and it changes the way he begins to evaluate how we are to live under the sun. He says this 
verse 24. There is nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also I saw is from the hand of God. So he's talking about previously how his life and his pursuits and his quest for accomplishment was vanity and it was worthless. And he comes to this conclusion as he stops looking out at everything horizontally and he looks up and he sees that what has been given by God to us are these moments and these things that we can enjoy, these constants in our life. He speaks here about these very basic and necessary things of life and that you can enjoy them. The word enjoy literally means to look upon the good. He's saying that you can look upon the good of the constants in your life, the basic and necessary things in your life that are constantly good. Food, drink, work, toil, as he says, shelter. Think about how that applies to your life. When you eat a meal, do you look upon the good? The good of the opportunity to get that coffee at spot you stop by every morning the good of that bottle of wine that you open on the weekend the the good of the clothes that you wear the good of the opportunity that you have to even buy the clothes the good of your bed your apartment your home say do you look upon the good in the basic and necessary things that you have You see, there's a Christian tradition around praying before a meal. And this is an opportunity for you to each and every day, at least three times the day, maybe six or seven for some of you that eat the small meals, to look upon the good. Oftentimes when we pray before a meal, we pray for God to bless the food. It's kind of a a ritual, which is always a little bit bizarre because you're praying for God to bless the food and you're eating cake and ice cream and bless it to my body like it's not that great for your body (laughs) but see here's why we pray before the meal it's not to ask God to change the elements of the food so that it can somehow be nourishing to your body when it's really not that healthy we pray to thank God and to look upon the good of the opportunity to enjoy that meal and to have that food so you can look upon the good whether you're eating keto you're eating cake has been given to you as a gift and you can do the same in your career you can do the same in your toil the same in your work you can look upon the good now i know for some of you that may be harder than for others you may be thinking to yourself i don't know where the good is i'm not in a great situation in my career i'm looking for a job i my boss is difficult to work with But where can you look upon the good? Where are the blessings? Is it in a paycheck that you have, even if it's not where you want it to be? Is it in the promotion that you just received or the one that you're pursuing? Is it in the people that you get to spend time with and God has put you around as an opportunity to befriend and to to share Jesus with? Is it in the products that you make or you market that are a benefit to individuals and neighborhoods, maybe the world? Or is it even in the process of learning and growth that you are in? There are blessings and good that can be found in your toil, in your career, in your work, and certainly in the basic and necessary things of life like food, and drink. You see, we can look upon the good, and we should. And that requires something of us, especially in regards to our career. And that is that we have to stop being so fixated on closing the gap between our current situation and that possible future situation that we're on a quest towards. We've got to stop being so fixated on closing that gap There's this ancient Greek paradox called, it's about Achilles and the tortoise. And here's how it goes. The tortoise goes to Achilles, who was this mighty warrior, swift and fast. 
The tortoise says, let's, let's have a race. You can never beat me. And Achilles is like, you're a tortoise. Of course I can beat you. He says, well, here's the rule. Here, here are the rules of the race. I get a 10-meter head start. So, okay, that's it's not a big deal. I can catch you in a second. But here's the other rule. You cannot pass me until you are perfectly equal with me. Until we are perfectly side by side, you cannot pass me. Okay, Achilles says. Tortoise is 10 meters out. The race starts. Tortoise starts taking one small, slow step after another. Achilles runs up to the tortoise, but he can't pass him because Every single time Achilles tries to get level with the tortoise, the tortoise, though moving slowly, has taken a small step, thus creating a gap. Every time, there's a gap. Now, the gap is getting smaller and smaller and smaller over time, but it it keeps getting divided. And so Achilles can never pass the tortoise because there's always a gap. He's never perfectly equal. He's just hurrying up to wait, hurrying up to wait, hurrying up to wait. This is how we live our lives, so many of us. Thinking that we're, we're gonna win the race. We're running this race, but we're just hurrying up to wait. We're never quite equal with our desired end of the accomplishments that we have and the vision that we have. We're never quite there. There's always a gap. And the preacher here is telling us, be the tortoise. Enjoy the good that is before you. Look upon it in your career and the constants in your life. But don't only look upon the good, but look up horizontal to vertical focus. Look at the second half of verse 24 and verse 25. Chapter 2. It says, This also I saw is from the hand of God. For apart from Him, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? Apart from Him, who can eat and who can have enjoyment? You can look upon the good in your life. But ultimately, you have to look up because everything is from Him. He is the true good that gives the blessings of good in your life. Who, he says, can eat or drink and find enjoyment apart from Him? You cannot. You know, going back to the Greeks again, they believe that happiness was a miracle. It was so hard to find that if it was found, it was a miracle. Improbable. And so they actually created a literary device used in plays and used now all the time in stories and in movies called Deus Ex Machina. Deus Ex Machina is God out of the machine. And what would take place in their plays is that when there was, a, when there was tension And when the story felt like everything was going wrong and there was no possible chance of a happy ending, they would lower down a godlike, a divine being from a crane who would come down from the heavens and would bring resolution to the conflict, would provide the happy ending in the story. Deus ex machina, God from the machine. It's used all the time. Anytime you watch a movie and you think to yourself, well, how convenient was that? Completely improbable, but it saved the day. That is the deus ex machina literary device. Think about Jurassic Park, the original Jurassic Park, when they're surrounded by the raptors and you think it's over. There's no way they're going to get out of this. And guess what? Down from the heavens comes the T-Rex who attacks the velociraptors and they escape onto freedom. See, they believed that happiness was improbable. So they created the deus ex machina, which would bring resolution to problems, would provide a happy ending, and it was lowered from heaven down to earth. 
And it really was a miracle given. What do we believe? Not God out of the machine, but God who has come down for us. Jesus Christ. Who brings resolution to a problem that we have. The problem of sin. The problem of a a broken relationship with God. And yet Jesus lowers himself from heaven to earth. He is in fact the miracle given. To bring what? Resolution to your life and your relationship with God and to bring the very satisfaction and meaning that you desire. You will not find it in your quest for accomplishment. You will not find it in your career. It will not be lasting, temporary, a vapor of satisfaction. No. We need God who has come down from heaven. We need to not only look out and think that we're going to extract the meaning and satisfaction we want in life in our accomplishments. No, we need to look up to the one who lowered himself down for our sake. God with us, Jesus Christ. Look what the preacher says in verse 26. He says, For the one who pleases him, God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy. For the one that pleases God receives knowledge and wisdom and joy. Well, how do you please God? The answer is, you don't. You just look up. You just look at Him. Listen to what the author of Hebrews tells us. Hebrews chapter 12, second half of verse 1 and verse 2 says this. It'll sound familiar. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Bad news before good news. Despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. You see, How do you please God? You don't. You look to Jesus. You look up. You run the race chasing after Him, looking towards Him, not having just a horizontal focus, but having a vertical focus. That is how you run the race of life. That is the quest that you are to be on. Not a quest for your own accomplishment. No, a quest that you are running after Jesus who has accomplished everything for you. You are not the founder and perfecter of your faith. Jesus is. He despised the shame. He went to the cross before you. He endured the bad news of your life so that you could live a good news life, a resurrected life, a life of freedom, a life of joy, a life where you can look upon the good even when you're in a difficult situation in life. Even when you haven't accomplished everything and something stirs in you and you feel like a failure because you're struggling with envy as you're comparing yourself to other people, you can look upon the good, the blessings that God has given you because you're not only looking at them, you're also looking at Him. I love what the Apostle Paul says in the book of Colossians. He says this in verse 19 and 20 of chapter 1. For in him, that is Jesus, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. You see, Jesus Christ God in the flesh lowered himself down to us, a miracle given, so that through surrender at the foot of the cross, you might find death to your quest for accomplishment, as if that's going to provide some semblance of meaning and satisfaction. It will not. It will prove itself vain. You cannot envision and create and believe in your own universe and just see it formed around you. What will form in you is envy and struggle and anxiety No, that is not the race that we are called to run. We are called to run a race where we look at what is around us and we enjoy it. We look upon the good of our current situation. 
believing not in the future that we're going to create and envision for ourselves, but in the future that's already been promised to us. Because Jesus took the cross for us. Because he has reconciled all things, including us in our life, to him. That is how we live. We look upon the good and we look up to him. And so here's what I want to ask you to do, church. Friends, if you are struggling in your life with envy and you are struggling with this quest for accomplishment that you have been running after, feeling like a failure, thinking that you're just going to have Aowen syndrome and you're, gonna, you're just going to work really hard and push really hard, I want to ask you to readjust your vision. It may be that you're just focused horizontally. You're just looking at everything around you. Look up. Look to Jesus. Because when you look to him, he will reestablish your vision. So that as you navigate this life and you look at your accomplishments and your work and the goals that you have before, you can enjoy and find joy. Look upon the good of all that is before you. And not walk away feeling empty. See, the direct end of your life is not what you accomplish. It's what's been accomplished for you on the cross. Jesus Christ is your direct end. Would you look to him as you run this race? Will you pray with me? God, we run after everything else in life but you. We get sidetracked. We get captivated by envy. Help us to look to you, the founder and perfecter of our faith. And would you reestablish and reorient our vision so that we would be running after you on a quest to glorify you and to run the race well, not basing our identity and our own accomplishments, but our identity, be, our, our identity being founded in your accomplishment on the cross. Reframe our vision so that we can look upon the good of what is around us, not be striving after the wind. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless.